Hello, this is Daedalus with Nerds and Stuff, and today we'll be taking these two Grenadier fighting men from this to this. Let's get started. So I've already primed the model black, and we're just going to start in with his pants. Uh, this is kind of just a speed paint, so I'm just going kind of quick and dirty. Um, just taking some brown and applying it fairly liberally, just trying to build up a nice color, uh, kind of for his, his legs there. Since they're kind of the deepest layer, that's where I figured I'd start. Uh, they're going to be the most difficult to get to, uh, kind of once things get going. So, uh, these two models are really old. <laughs> I don't know when, but uh, my uncle purchased them and gave them to me uh, about eight years ago. So they're probably at least 15. Uh, they're all, they're just pewter. I uh, just kind of, I got a big old box from him that were just a, a mix of Ralpartha models. And I, I guess some other brands too. I honestly thought these were Ralpartha until I saw one pop up on Reddit the other day and uh, it was kind of interesting to know the the true set release came from. So now we've just moved on to start of the green on his cloak. The next deepest layer. So just once again applying the paint kind of liberally. Uh, he doesn't have a whole lot of his cloak exposed um, because most of it's covered with his chainmail. So now we're just hitting the black parts, uh, you know, making sure anything that accidentally got hit with the other coats gets covered up. Um, just building up color mostly. I'm coming off of black and this green is the brilliant green and it doesn't cover super well so you need a couple of coats but once you do get it built up it looks really nice so now I'm just coming through with the chainmail silver and just hitting all the metal you know not going super careful because we're, we're speed painting these but making sure to not just drag it across all those areas and undo all that work I've already done it's kind of easy with these guys because the majority of the model is metal between the shield and his chainmail and his helmet there's not a lot else going on so doing this one step with the metallics saves a lot of time because honestly there's not much else to do he's got a really cool helmet I, I liked it on this model uh, he's got kind of a visor wrap around it reminds me a lot of the uh, like Viking armor from some of the, the like old relics they're finding that have these dramatic eye slots, kind of, uh, we'll call them eye protection, to catch any kind of axe or blade that might be coming across, so that even though you just got rang in the head, you're uh, going to be able to stay on your feet for a little bit. So yeah, just going through with that metallic paint and hitting everything, you know, his sword and the side of his shield, uh, just trying to get this base metallic layer down. So then I can do uh, some more fancy, we'll say, metal trim on top and uh, kind of see where the model's looking. So just making sure I've got all these little crannies uh, kind of under the arms and at the edges with other layers. Uh, just applying that metal paint. It may not seem like it, but these models are actually really small <laughs> compared to, we'll say, the standard 28 millimeter heroic size that's used now these are probably like a 22 or 23 they're pretty small by comparison so these details are super obscured uh, just getting a little bit of flesh tone down now getting his hand and his face he's got a beard too so I just kind of hit the lower parts of the face and I'll come back with the brown and get the beard um, not a lot of skin showing just that hand in his face so now we're gonna come through and kind of get that beard like we talked about before he's just applying some brown to hopefully break out or break up the monotony of the color on the face he's also got this really cool kind of uh, handlebar mustache going on that ties in with the beard very well pronounced so now I'm just gonna take some dark brown and come in and kind of get the uh, the handle of his axe there miss that with the metallic so I'm gonna have to come back and get the axe head but just get some dark brown to look like wood, and uh, we're pretty much good there. Just adding a little bit of color, making it not black. Now we're getting that axe head colored that I missed. He's got this little thing on the top of his axe. I don't know if it's like uh, 
a, a pivot or like um, some kind of skull or something. It just, it kind of just looked like a little blob. I, I decided to go with it as a skull later on, but it's just really weird on the edge of that axe. You know, you'd expect a little bit of wood poking out the top, um, kind of as the axe head is mounted, but this one didn't really have that. It just had that weird little piece on top of the head. So now I'm just taking some dark brown and getting kind of the back parts of the shield so it looks semi-nice. Uh, just doing some touch-ups now in a couple of places. Just working fast and kind of plinking as we go. So now I'm going to take care of this leather strap he's got going across his shoulder that holds his sword. Uh, it's just super small. I just want to get a nice leather brown on so that we recognize that it's there. Now part of speed painting is trying to figure out how much detail you want to put on stuff and kind of where to make sacrifices. Since this one was kind of very well pronounced, uh, this was one of those places I didn't want to make any sacrifices. Now I'm also getting his belt across the middle of his waist. Uh, it's also fairly well pronounced, so I didn't want to skip on that either. You could get away without the, the waist belt, because it could just be like the, the tailored armor. But I've already got the leather out, and I'm already hitting some leather spots, so it's really not that big of a deal, and just adds a little bit of extra detail without being very time-consuming. I'm just making sure I've got all that leather kind of down into his chest. It's, it's sculpted all the way across, so I'm thinking they, uh, they made his torso first and then put the, the shield on when they were sculpting the initial model. Um, now I'm just doing some highlights, just making sure we've got the color built up well on all the places where the light might hit. I think I've mixed a little bit of um, white in as well, or excuse me, a little bit of yellow to step up the green to do kind of a rough highlight real quick. I, I don't want to go super into the highlights, not like I usually do. This is just kind of a, a quick and dirty way to show some real distinction between the folds and kind of the shadows. And then just doing again with a little bit more yellow mixed in for make it a little bit brighter and just doing even more extreme edges. This is probably more on par with like the, the three layer highlighting technique. You know, you step, you take your base coat, step up one layer, for mid-range highlights and then one more layer for like extreme highlights and then you wash it down. You know, I'm very familiar with that method, I've seen it a lot. Just doing the same thing on his pants now with a lighter brown. I'm about to give this model a wash and kind of darken everything up so I wanted to get the highlights done before doing what is effectively a dip wash. Um, some people use like the Army Painter Quick Shades, literally hold the model and just plunge it in and pull it out. I don't really care for dip shading. Um, I'll usually, personally, I, I will usually take and mix shades or use the Citadel shades that are color specific for the area I'm kind of shading. I don't typically just take one and go over all of it, but we're speed painting. You know, we're not doing the super best quality work we can. We're trying to get models done. So I'm just doing some quick highlights on his boots. Just kind of the leather, or the, the black leather style with just some grays. Still doing that three highlight method. Just trying to get a few edges to give the boots some depth. I mean, they're sculpted on there. I might as well you know, take advantage of the sculpt. Okay, so we've got those highlights pretty much done for the cloth. Now we're just going to do some armor highlights. I started going with a real dark, kind of real dark bronze. I didn't really like how it was looking, it just looked kind of dirty, so I came back with the brass. Now, that bright brass I like to use. It, it just, it looks so good with silver. I don't know. Maybe I just, I found a color pattern I really like, so I tend to use it a lot, but... Uh, it, it just looks good. Even when shaded down, it still provides good contrast to just your generic silver. So I'm just getting the kind of the armor trim, the mounting brackets on his helmet, and his eyepiece. I figured that would be a little more of a show piece as opposed to kind of just practical. I don't know. If you're if you're wearing a helmet and you kind of want every advantage you've got, you want it to be a little bit scary so that your opponents might be intimidated. So now we're just taking that bronze and just getting the details on the shield too. All these places where there's trim. 
just make it stand out a little bit. I think if I was doing this with a kind of a real lengthy paint, I actually would have done that shield trim in kind of a bone color. Um, a lot of uh, these little soldiers remind me of, we'll say, Vikings. Uh, they, they just kind of look that way. They've got the beards and everything. And a lot of Viking shields were actually kind of uh, sealed or wrapped with uh, leather, kind of like a rawhide, you know, real hard stuff, as opposed to metal. You know, these were all the wooden shields. They use this hard leather all the way around. And these are the rawhides like you give dogs to chew on, kind of that quality of leather. And that would stop the shield from splintering when it got hit. And you would just replace that after battle if it got sliced in enough places that your shield was starting to fragment and all that. Um, just know a little too much about some parts of medieval history. <laughs> the internet's full of those little snippets. So now we're just going to put a paper towel down. Um, I'm actually going to do the base real quick, at least the base coat. This is just sterling mud. Um, effectively, you can make this by taking brown paint and some coarse sand and just mixing them together. And that's pretty much all it is. So if you don't want to buy the expensive Citadel texture paints, I mean expensive as in like, I think the bottle was $4, um, you can just make your own. Or do what I usually do and just do a, a glue and sand mix and then just paint it afterwards. But once again, we're doing this the quick and dirty method. So getting this down and just making sure we've got some texture across the base, trying to build a little bit of uh, kind of a little bit of transition between where the metal is just glued on so that it doesn't look like a metal base is glued onto a piece of plastic. It's going to be kind of hard to do with just a little bit of sand, but I can hope, right? Alright, now that we've got that done, we're just going to give it all a wash with Nolan Oil. We're just coming through and applying it liberally. And this will give the, the shadows and kind of the dirty look on the metal all those great things we love out of a shade. Just applying it nice and thick. Uh, once again, we're just doing speed paint here, so we just want to get those shadows done. And fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, black is very forgiving. If you miss spots or whatever, and you give it a thick wash and it pools there, it'll cover up your mistakes. So that's why so many people like the dip method, because if you were painting and miss something or it doesn't look quite right, and you dip it, you're going to have so much left over that no one can see that you messed up. And now I'm just kind of dabbing it off, making sure all these places got good shadows, like around the, uh, the armor trim there on the shield. We really want that to be more shadow because it makes it stand out more. Also just bleeding off any places where maybe a little too much got on, or um, kind of just fine-tuning the, the wash. And we'll just set that guy aside for a little bit and start on the next. That's right, folks, you're getting two models for the price of one in this video. And so we're just going to start with this guy. Much like before, he's prime black. We're starting with a darker brown on his pants, where we kind of had a medium brown on the other one. This one we're going full dark. He doesn't have a whole lot of his pants showing either. Um, he's got a tunic that hangs kind of low. Much more tunic on this one than the other model. So I chose to go with kind of a, a more fun color for this tunic. We are just speed painting. At best, I think these models will probably be used as, like, generic guards for a tabletop RPG game or something. You know, they're not going to see the table often. They're probably going to spend most of their time just sitting on their shelf looking pretty. But that's okay. That's why we paint, right? I like to keep my painted stuff all displayed so that I can look at it and enjoy it. You know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time painting nice things just to cover them up or keep them stashed in army bags. But, even just as a shelf carrier, this guy is going to look nice. We're coming in with, this is a really bright blue, a lot brighter than I usually do. Uh, this is the Surf Aqua. It's got kind of a greenish tinge to it in person, just a little bit, that doesn't come across well through the camera. Um, the one I use, it's, it's Logitech C920. I find that, for whatever reason, it doesn't really handle those kind of blue-greens well. When I was streaming regularly, I would sometimes be painting a, a certain style of model, which is, for those that know, it's an incorporeal model for the War Machine game. I kind of have this technique I use that is a real kind of light blue-green that makes them look ghostly. And I'm trying to paint that, and 
the webcam will sit there and jump back and forth because for whatever reason it just can't process that shade of blue and just kind of an odd little odd thing that I discovered in the meantime we've gone and painted his face and just getting his hands now doing these fleshy things getting them out of the way this one doesn't have the fancy eye guard so you can actually see his full face um, we're not going to be doing eyes because the model's really small and once again we're doing speed painting he's also looking down uh, so if you were to use him on a tabletop type look you're not going to be able to see his eyes because they're going to be obscured by the shadow of his helmet now usually if I wasn't speed painting I, I would do them you know, that's the thorough look I go for and it tends to pay off for when you do pick it up and look at it and look close and then you see his little eyes and um, that's just that different level of quality so just getting this brown in his hair figured if these are Bretonian models or whatever they may be, some kind of English foot soldiers or uh, from Viking times, however you want to slice it, brown hair is super common across Caucasian, uh, we'll say nationalities. A little less common with the Vikings, most of them hailing from the northern lands have blonde hair, but uh, we'll, we'll say this brown is kind of a sandy, so it could go either way. So just taking and getting that axe now, just like before, nice real dark brown on the axe. Not trying to pick up a whole lot of wood detail, same with the shield he's got on his back, just getting the inner side that's wood. And while I've got the dark brown on the brush, I might as well touch up his pants. It is the same color on this one. See, this axe has got a sensible piece of wood just coming out the top and not some weird little rat skull or something. Uh, now just hitting his chainmail. He doesn't have as much as the other guy. He, this guy's got a tunic on top of his chainmail. Make him quieter um, than just clomping around. But, you know, that's just the diversity between the two models. I guess in this set there's like ten different sculpts that are all just little foot soldiers. There's a couple with crossbows and stuff. I might have more of the set stashed away in that miscellaneous Ziploc bag full of old models that my uncle gave me, but uh, maybe I'll pull some out in the future do more speed paints with the old stuff because yeah mostly if I use these they're gonna be for a tabletop RPG they're not gonna be used nearly as frequently as the armies so I may not do as, them as often but they're always fun to pull out once in a while see how the casting technology has changed kind of how things are a lot more detailed and bigger and still good quality I mean this is great for what they had it's actually really not bad it's just small and I already have enough problems with small stuff that making the models even smaller doesn't help those damn shaky hands so while I've been yammering on we have done most of the metallics just like before just getting down the silver base coat uh, we're gonna do some fun things with those after we're done getting the silver down just like before we'll be doing the same kind of bright bronze highlighting that makes that two-tone metal that I enjoy so much and now just do some touch-ups on his face, make sure that the flesh is still standing out, making sure I haven't dragged paint across while doing other stuff. Um, also just building up the flesh tone on a black primer. Takes a few coats to get looking good and not patchy. This guy's got really long fingers, it seems, on the sculpt coming around the, the axe handle. It just seems like they are a lot, little longer than they should be. Now I'm just taking some brown and going over this beard, trying to make a good distinction between his flesh tone and kind of the light brown of his hair and stuff. A little difficult, they're, they're fairly similar, um, just kind of the unfortunate nature of skin kind of looking like medium tan. So just doing touch-ups all across the model even. Now just coming back with that blue and making sure the tunic's nice and bright. Um, I'm also adding a little bit of uh, green into it to kind of give it a, a semi-different color for the highlights so it looks like it's not quite uh, it gives it a kind of a, an interesting look it, it's not quite a blue green and it's it's kind of in the shadows a little brighter blue it's almost like one of those fabrics that doesn't quite look right I don't know how else to describe it besides you just you look at it and the threads kind of change depending on how the light catches I'm probably just talking in circles, but I'm sure there are a few people out there that understand. 
Now just doing a little bit of white in and getting those extreme highlights, trying to give it a little more depth for when it gets washed down. And now we're just gonna take some brown, come up and touch up his pants again. I keep seeming to get blue on them, and then start to highlight them. Same method, just adding a little bit of lighter tan in and kind of picking out those few edges that exist to give the pants some depth. He's also got this bag on the back of his waist. It's kind of hidden by his shield, but it just hangs out right there. I just noticed it, and so I, I gave it some dark brown and just gonna give it a little bit of medium brown. Since it is stashed so far under his shield, I figure it probably won't be too well noticed. Um, not enough that it has to catch a lot of light because it's under his shield. You know, not a lot of light's gonna get to it. So now we're working on those boots, same as before. I like black boots, they look good. I find I usually do black boots or brown boots. If I do brown boots, I don't do brown pants. I'll usually do some other kind. Occasionally, like a cloth pant with kind of a yellowish type cloth. That, it depends. But I do like how black boots look. They just look nice and professional. And just doing the same highlights as before. Taking some medium grays and stepping up. Um, picking out those areas where the light hits. Kind of forcing some highlights. Looks good though. Just doing some touch-ups on the metal uh, where colors might have strayed while I was doing the other touch-ups. Kind of a lot of speed painting is also touching up your touch-ups because you're going quickly, you're not taking as much time to be careful, so you make more mistakes. They say the average human being who isn't under time duress makes between three and five mistakes uh, an hour. While under time pressure, that jumps to uh, 7 to 11 mistakes per hour. There's a little trivia nugget for you. He does have a leather waistband around his sword, so I was just getting that too. Um, not a lot of the rest of his belt can be seen though, so not worried too much about that. Coming through with that bright bronze now and just getting those, those armor trim pieces. Getting pretty close to done with this guy, too. We're gonna have a nice little surprise later with the, uh, kind of, there's a little gem, almost, kind of a, or maybe just a big rivet right in the middle of that armor trim in the middle of the shield. So I'm, I've got some in the works for that, you'll see. A little bit to help make them kind of unique, stand out a little bit more. It's not much, but every little bit helps. So I'm just taking my time with that brass, it goes, or that bronze, excuse me. It goes down well, but usually takes two good coats to get solid coverage without loading up your brush on your initial coat. So since I'm still the careful painter, I do like to come through with the light coat first to make sure it's going in the right place and then follow up with another light coat instead of just going super heavy. Probably could have saved a little bit of time just going super heavy, but... I, although I do speed paint on occasion, I find I usually end up coming back and slowing down when I'm in the middle of it because I get into the old habits of non-speed painting. So I tend to not paint full units of stuff a lot because it takes a long time for me. <laughs> the units end up looking great because, you know, every one of them was basically the base coats were painted all at one time and then from there on out I kind of went on a one by one basis, but that's not really efficient when you've got you know, a real war game you're trying to play and field three or four units at a time. Unfortunately, that kind of makes for a lot of silver on the table. But that's all right, I'll get to them. It's just doing the same as before, being adventurous, not putting down a uh, paper towel on this one. Just trying to get that mud down so it looks good and doesn't kind of look like it's just brown paint on a flat black base. It is nice that Citadel does come out with these sorts of paints, though. Um, it, it is convenient once in a while to have something like this pre-made, especially in a sealable pot where you don't have to just mix it on your uh, your palette or whatever. I, I wouldn't want to mix something like this on a wet palette anyway, because it wouldn't really benefit and probably gunk up the rest, but you know, your mileage may vary. So now that he's all good, we're just going to get that paper towel down for the wash. I was careful with the mud. I, I can afford to not have the paper towel down during the mud. And just like before, laying it on thick. 
coming in with the Nuln Oil, making sure all our shadows are done and that it's not pooling anywhere it's not supposed to, and just making sure the armor or the uh, the shield gets done really well. A lot of those details look a lot better, as I said before, when they've got a heavy shadow around them. They tend to stand out. Went a little crazy on the base, gonna have to pull some of that off so it can dry in a reasonable amount of time. So now that it's all down, I'm just coming back with the brush and cleaning up, making sure that too much isn't pooling in some areas, and that color is getting where it's supposed to. Like there, I had a whole bunch pooling on the bottom of the shield, but uh, not up at the top. So just redistribute that. Just managing the wash, just like usual. This is also a lot thicker of wash than I usually use. I don't take Nuln Oil straight from the bottle very often. I usually water it down first, because if you take Nuln Oil straight from the bottle and you let it pool for just a fraction of a second too long and then you grab it, it leaves a real terrible mark behind, and then you're just kind of stuck playing catch up afterwards. So, now that the wash is dry, we're just going to take and do that little, little extra detail I was talking about. I'm just going to get real close on the shield there, and just take some silver and go right on that little nub. Make sure I got it looking good. Covered well. It's unnaturally bright, just the way I was hoping. And while that silver dries, we'll get the other one too. It's not much. It's, like I said, just this tiny little nub. Could be a big rivet just holding that front piece in. Now I'm coming through with the clear paints. And I got clear blue on the guy with the blue tunic and putting some clear green on the guy with the green tunic. Now it just kind of looks like they've got a little bit of a, a green gem on the front. I didn't, you know, this is a good speed way to do gems too. It's just the silver underneath with the clear paint on top. I think they look a lot better when you end up painting the refraction layers inside, but we're speed painting. So now we're just gonna get the edges on the base where kind of the brown has strayed. I always like having that nice uh, black edge visible when I'm not doing over bases. I don't know, it, it looks clean, it looks... To me it looks more like a display piece. If it sits there and you can see that black border around it, it clearly is like, this is a, a nice a nice thing, a, a nice model, something to be put on a shelf and looked at. And just my personal opinion. Some people choose to have their bases look like they're going straight onto the uh, kind of the ground. If I was doing diorama stuff, um, I would probably do that too. That or make inserts, especially if it was a diorama where I wanted the pieces to be playable, you know, where you can remove them and play with them. Then I'd probably do it that way and just have the inserts kind of sit down in so the black can still be present for like model playing, but not super stand out on the, the display, the diorama. But anyway, let's talk about basing. I'm just using some super glue. I tried using my gel stuff and it's not gelling too well. It uh, need a new bottle, getting pretty low. So now I'm just dipping a toothpick in the stuck bottle of my liquid super glue, which isn't working as well as I'd hoped. I'm just gonna apply some grass flocking. I usually don't use this. Um, I like the tufts more, but this is a lot faster than the tufts and you get different coverage. To me, this looks like grass that's been cut, whereas the tufts look like grass that's alive. Um, but it doesn't really matter here. So that didn't cover quite as well as I was hoping. Um, I think some of the glue dried before I was able to get it in the flock. So just going to try this dip method a few more times and try and apply some glue that way. Um, I just I couldn't get the nose undone. It was just cemented on. And so I was just trying to do this as a quick method, trying to cut a corner as it was and it still isn't quite covering like I want just not getting enough hair or enough of this flocking in place so it, it looks really patchy not kind of whole like I was hoping but I'm nothing if not persistent so I'll just keep at it keep kind of applying this glue in small areas so that it has doesn't have time to dry before I can get the flocking on just keep going. It's starting to get a little more full. Um, decided to just let that one be and work on the other one. Got some of that gel on the, the rock to hold it in place. You know, I, I love these little rocks. I just, I literally found them outside, out in the desert. 
just out for a walk and found some real fine rocks, scooped them up, put them in my pocket. Um, I put some uh, accelerant right there on the rock so that it would harden quickly. Um, sometimes I don't just do the spray because it goes everywhere. And if I've got other super glue I'm trying to use on the base, it'll instantly dry as soon as it's applied. So I sometimes just take the spray nozzle out and just tap the bottom part of the spray pump hose, which has usually got enough on it that once I make contact, you know, capillary action or whatever takes place and it just runs down and goes where it needs to. So applying more with the uh, open neck glue method and the toothpick. Trying to really get that flocking covering well. Learn from my mistakes, kids. If your super glue bottle won't open, just get it open or get a new one and take better care of it. You know, shame on me. I didn't take good enough care of my glue and it got glued together. I finally took some time and some pliers and really went to town on it. Got it open and um, I've been a little more careful with it since. <laughs> Because now it's getting the kind of coverage I was hoping for. Real heavy-duty grass. Once I finally, you know, sat down and cracked it, I had to run out to the garage and get my pliers. Two pair of pliers, grab it around the neck and kind of the lid and rip it off. And now I'm just doing some spot glue. So taking this and just kind of pushing the toothpick down and then letting it run down the toothpick. So it's kind of a more precise way to use the, the super glue without it just running out of this nozzle. Unfortunately with this glue, it's really nice glue, but it's really liquidy and it dries really fast and runs everywhere. So using this method, I'm coming through and um, just kind of tapping it off. Now I'm just taking my airbrush, no paint or anything, just using it to blow out any flocking that's not quite there. And that's going to pretty much do it for these. Yeah, I'm just putting the pegs back in so that I can kind of show you the, the face front of the model. And there he is. The knight holding his axe and no shield. She's giving it a slow spin. And the other knight as well. And that's going to pretty much do it for us today, folks. There you go. You got two speed painted models ready for the tabletop. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please do so so you can be notified when additional content comes out. And until next time, happy painting.